It happens a lot these days where people are so discouraged and depressed that they're just tempted to take their lives. If you know what that's like, uh, I do know what that's like, and I want to tell you, don't do it. There's hope for you. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Hi, and welcome back to part two of a three-part series called Finding Hope in Depression and Despair. Uh, I am Pastor Steve Wahlberg, and my guest is Christy Christopher, and we're here to share with you uh, what we've been through and how God has rescued us and saved our lives and how he can save you too. Uh, Christy Christopher works for a man, at least as one of her jobs, his name is Dr. Neil Nedley. He is the uh, head physician and the director of a wonderful program called Depression and Recovery Program. Actually, the full program is called Anxiety. How do you say it? Uh, it's Depression and Anxiety Program. That's right, Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program. He's written a book called Depression, The Way Out. Uh, Christy Christopher is my guest. She uh, works for Dr. Nedley during his program. Uh, she is a registered nurse in uh, Texas, in the Fort Worth area, in Dallas. Uh, and the, the hospital you work again, that's called Medical City? Uh -huh, Medical City in Dallas. Medical City, yeah. yes. And uh, Christy, in, our, in part one, she shared her story where she uh, grew up in Pennsylvania and uh, made some, some poor choices and got involved in the wrong crowd and started uh, also dealing with depression and she had suicidal uh, thoughts and tried to take her life five times, but each time uh, miraculously she survived. Amen. And so Christy, uh, we wanna continue on with the story. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a privilege, thank, thank you, you for, for coming me. here. Yeah, as I mentioned in part one, uh, at the time when we're doing this, when we're filming this, mm -hmm. recording this, uh, we are in the coronavirus crisis. Yes, yes. Uh, and who knows, you know, how long this will go on. People that may watch this program in the future, we may not be in this crisis. We don't know, mm -hmm. but we do know that uh, whether we are or whether we're not, there's going to be other crises that right. people are going to be going through, and that's just part of living in this in this sinful world mm -hmm. until Jesus comes back and gets rid of sin. That's right. So uh, a lot of people are struggling with depression, anxiety, fear. Uh, worry, uh, medications that they're on. Mm -hmm. and, and isn't it true, Christy, that uh, generally speaking, most of the time when a person is depressed and they go to their, their family physician, that most of the time they're just prescribed some kind of antidepressant. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that right? Um, sometimes women will have symptoms where they will just cry for no reason and men typically have more of that feeling of emptiness. And so the women will a lot of times go to the physician's office and say, I don't know why I'm just crying. And it's something simple may have happened and they just cry over something that normally they wouldn't cry about. And so a lot of times the physician will prescribe them an antidepressant at that point. And what about so. the men? Uh, the men do not seek treatment. I don't have statistics on this, but the men typically don't uh, seek treatment as often as women. So it's okay. actually uh, underdiagnosed. So is that why, uh, at least from what we read in the last last program, we talked about uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization, and they did say that uh, depression is more common among women than among men. And is that simply because the men don't get diagnosed as much? I would much? suspect, so in my opinion, I would suspect that. So it's probably yeah. equal. I would think so. It's probably underreported. Um, a lot of times, even with suicide, men are more successful because they will do uh, more fatal means to try to end their lives. Really? So. Do you think that a lot of people who try to commit suicide, if their attempt is unsuccessful, it's because maybe somewhere inside there they, they didn't try hard enough? Whereas with the men, you said they're often more successful with the women, do they? It, it's hard to say. I know though they have done studies on um, patients who have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge to try to commit suicide. And a lot of them will have the thought as they're falling that, why did I do this? I wish I could take this back. And so it's an impulsive act. And so a lot of times it can, you know, if it intervenes in the right way, uh, it may not have to get to that point. 
And I'm assuming yeah. the people that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and have that thought on the way down that they survived. They survived yeah, precisely. because how, how is anybody <laughs> going to know <laughs> right, that right. they had that That's thought? True. Yes, exactly. So, and thank God that there are a lot of times that, that the attempts are not successful. Right. Praise In God. your case, you've had five. Yes. And I'll share a little bit more later uh, how I, I never really uh, tried to kill myself, but when I went through one of my deep struggles with depression and anxiety and, and the medication that I was on, the temptation was very strong. Mm -hmm. It was just like this running voice inside my head, you know, just take your life, take your life, take your life, just, you know, end it all. Uh, you don't have to worry about this much longer. Just, mm -hmm. you know, I'd be driving down the highway and, and this thought would come to me, just, you know, if the car's coming the other way, just go over on the other side That's and awesome. just boom, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. but I, I never did that. <laughs> yeah, praise God. I'm mm -hmm. thankful, I'm very thankful that, and, and that's behind me now. Good. You know, all that's behind me. I, I feel really good right now. Yay. We got up both this morning yeah. and uh, uh, we texted each other and uh, you're staying not far from my house. And so we got up and we met this morning and we both went jogging at that about 6.30 and <laughs> we were just in, in North Idaho. Yeah. Uh, my dog ran with us that's and so we are fun. both very thankful Amen. to be alive. Amen. That we both struggled with depression. We've struggled with anxiety. We've struggled mm -hmm. with medication yeah. and suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. but God has been good to us. Amen. That's, that's right. Me. Okay. So, uh, and we want to give people hope. That's, right. that's why we're here. That's right. So let's go back to, you, you mentioned that you had, you know, you were, you were married and your divorce uh, was a real very difficult for you and mm -hmm. you have a seven-year-old boy yeah. and then you uh it was a failed suicide attempt in a, in a hotel mm -hmm. yeah. and after three days you woke up yeah. and you survived and it wasn't long after that that your your mother called you yeah and said that uh, i'm about to meet dr nedley or he's standing right in front of me yeah dr neil nedley and he connected you with him yes and you enrolled in his program in right. Rumar, california northern california and uh, and you told us also that you your mother told you you get to go to california and lay out in the sun <laughs> that's not what happened that's but not that was happened. her that was the way she enticed you <laughs> to go to dr nedley's me. program that's right because i thought it was going to be fun and games and we get to kind of lay out by the pool but yeah. Um, dot, 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 found out that it was more like a mental health boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, was, it was vastly different, but it's what I needed. What I just needed. didn't know it at the time. Yeah. So, but. okay. So tell, let's just, let's just follow on with your story. Um, just tell us about maybe your trip there and then what happened when you got there. So the trip there was okay. I mean, there wasn't a lot of eventfulness. I just, you know, flew to California. From um, DFW. From DFW. Pro you probably landed in Sac Sac Central. Right, landed Sacramento in Sacramento. International Airport. I was smoking at the time, so I had one last cigarette at the airport before okay. Daniel picked me up. <laughs> so Daniel? Um, Daniel was the one that picked he's me the, up. He's the massage therapist yes, there, too. Yes, yes. He's the, the missionary pilot from right. Venezuela that comes and does the program. Yeah, he has an incredible story. He does. He lives in the jungle in the yes, bush. Yes, it's amazing. And he helps kids. I know. He's incredible. Him and his wife both, they do a lot of mission and outreach and things. and. He was, he was a very, um, he was very kind. Yes. <laughs> I was very difficult. So um, Daniel picked you up at the airport. Yes. And yes. drove you an hour north That's to right. Remar That's Institute. Right. Yeah. And he, he was trying to make small talk, but I was pretty closed off. Um, really my thoughts towards other people, I just was pretty closed off and just wanting to just isolate, do my own thing. Um, you know, stick with my bad habits and just, you know, everyone just kind of keep a distance. And uh, going to the program, I didn't know really what to expect, um, but I got there and it's not the poolside. Um, it was, you know, I had gone away from the church and so I had a, a negative view about God in the church. And so when I got there, I realized it was a very spiritual atmosphere. Uh, I was not going to be able to smoke <laughs> in that setting, and I just wanted out. Um, I was not on board with the program from the get-go. I was pretty like, okay, I want out of here. I didn't know where I was going to go. I just wanted out of there. And did you, did, were you still on medication at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you still. remember what you were taking? Uh, I think it was clonazepam. It was one of the stair-step stair medications. I was on trazodone, Adderall, um, Cymbalta. And there was something else that they had me on. So I was on the five or six different heavy duty pharmaceutical drugs. 
And were you drinking at that point too? At that point I wasn't. I just had been smoking. sober. And yeah, no just... other uh, drugs? Like... No other drugs, yeah. Okay. Just, uh, prescription. And so. were you, and were you um, as far as your thoughts about God, you said you just wanted no really nothing to do with him I didn't at that point? Anything, yeah. And you weren't planning on any of that changing. No, I was pretty. Now, I'm, cu I'm curious also, were you, how about your sleeping? Were you, a lot of people that go through the program, like when I went through it, uh, I, I, there was four days in a row, oh. four nights in a row, wow. where actually I didn't sleep at all. That was the worst mm -hmm. of my insomnia. It was yeah. four nights in a row, no sleep. Yeah. It was awful. So how about you? Were you That's sleeping at rough. that time? Um, sometimes I'd stay up 24 hours and then just, hit the ground running just you know and there'd be times i was just, i don't know it was just adrenaline i guess mm -hmm. I was, but i had issues with sleep too a lot of insomnia a lot of anxiety um sometimes i'd just lay there just with racing thoughts and just i didn't know how to turn my mind off i'm yeah, just I like totally it kind of turned that. against me in yeah, a way can't and turn like, the mind off turn this off right now at that and, time you were still uh, you were an RN at the Medical City Hospital, correct? That was your uh, full-time job? At that point, job? it was at a level one trauma center. So I worked in intensive care. So there was, uh, we'd have care flights fly in, traumas, people mass transfused. So it was a lot of um, high intensity situation, life and death wow. situations at work. On and you were on medication basis. during that whole time. And I was on medication. Yeah. yeah. Did that affect so. your ability to think? Uh, I'm sure it did. Um, at the time, I was able to still do, you know, have good reviews at work by God's grace and still be able to take care of patients. But, you know, when Dr. Nedley saw the list of medications I was on and what I did, he's like, okay, <laughs> he's like, your brain is operational. We need to get you off of this stuff and get it better. We could optimize it. So it was, it was, it was hard. <laughs> well, so you were on medication, you were still smoking, you didn't want God. You didn't, you thought Weimar was going to be a vacation. Yeah, yeah. You didn't really know what you were getting into. You were there because your mother wanted you <laughs> exactly. there. She knew what you, you were, you were going to be getting into. Right, right. And so you, you landed there. Daniel, who's a, one of the massage therapists, picked you up, drove you, uh, and you drove on the campus. And then what happened? Ooh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was upset. Uh, you know, I, I think I took my cigarettes and went down to the river or something. And I was trying to take these tests because they have you take a bunch of tests when you first come in, like, you know, your PQ-9 and your DAT test. And so I'm answering all these things. And, you know, I just was not a happy camper. I just didn't want to be there. <laughs> so it was, a, it was hard. I, I feel bad looking back of how difficult I was to deal with. And I feel sincerely sorry towards Dr. Nedley for, you know, that was difficult. The staff really was patient with me, really, really patient. They they basically loved me back to life is mm -hmm. how I how I term it. So, so the the Nedley program, um, you're you're with how many about nineteen other people or twenty other people? Twenty three. And you're other there for ten days, for 10 and, days. and you're pretty much isolated from the rest of the world. Right. And you're given a room. Right. Uh, I'm assuming at the Weimar Inn. That's it. You had a yeah. room at the inn. I had a room at the inn. Uh huh. And then they have sort of an orientation that yeah. kind of tells us what to expect. You fill out some paperwork, right? And you look around. You see other people that are depressed yeah. and anxious and not sleeping. And one thing they told me, or they told the group, that when you get up in the morning, if you're making friends with the with the other participants, that they don't want you to, you know, ask like if I saw you in the morning, you know, how'd you sleep? Yeah, they right. don't want you to say how'd you sleep, how'd you sleep, how'd you sleep, right. because most or a lot of times people don't sleep well, right? And they yeah. don't just, you know, they'd rather just kind of keep that under wraps at that's this it. point, that's not talk true. about it. Right, they still say that. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so let's go on. What, uh, it's 10 days and you got there, you got your room, you didn't want to be there, mm -hmm. and you started getting some blood tests and, yeah. and keep going. Um, what they discovered in the program too is they do comprehensive uh, panels on lab work and they do something called the Walsh panel. And that's not something that's typically done in most other programs. So that's something that Dr. Nedley trained on specifically to try to help participants um, with its epigenetics. Uh, basically with epigenetics, uh, it's said that lifestyle loads the gun, or no, genetics loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. And so some things can actually be changed. And so uh, in looking at some of the genetic uh, profiling though, that he did discover I have a metal metabolism disorder. So what that is, is typically you'll have ceruloplasmin that's kind of the carrier for copper that will draw that out of your cell. 
Uh, if it does not do that, there's some sort of dysfunction. It can manifest itself with uh, depression and low norepinephrine or high norepinephrine. And basically, like, a, you just don't take a lot of pleasure in life. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I had. And so there was a genetic component, too. So, the, the, so. with the copper, does that mean that there's more copper floating around in your bloodstream? Yes, precisely. So, yeah, so it's it's interesting that you have similar to what I, what I had because uh -huh. I, when I got to Weimar for the first time, I... This was in the summer of 2017. I was very depressed, uh -huh. and I was on lorazepam. And as I mentioned that last program. That's why Dr. Nedley told me on the phone, "You've got to get down here." And uh, and I went there, and I was, you know, all all mixed up and messed up. Didn't know if there was if it was possible that anybody could help me. Uh -huh. And they did the blood work just like they did with you. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Nedley looked at my chart, and he saw that in my brain I, there was a, a very elevated norepinephrine, just like uh, with okay. you, uh -huh. and there was very elevated uh, free copper, yes, just like with you, right? Yeah, and exactly. and those you know imbalances contribute to all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. and, and I've learned that you know as we, we've talked about, uh, sometimes people are depressed because of some event that happens in their lives, or they don't have hope, or they're just you know discouraged because of finances or a marriage or whatever else, and there are other times that there's just a, a, a chemical issue going on in the brain right. for whatever reason. Maybe it's genetics, mm -hmm. uh, too much free copper, too much uh, norepinephrine, mm -hmm. and that just helps contribute to the slide. Right. And that's, again, one of the wonderful things about Dr. Nedley's program is that he, he looks at all these things. Right. He doesn't right. just you know, diagnose you, oh, you're depressed, right. let me give you a medicine. Right. But he looks at your blood work and he says, ah, oh, here's all these things going on and let's see if we can give you some supplements right. to help with this. Right. Yeah, and, that, and that's very hopeful for a lot of people too coming in. It was very hopeful for me to find that out because then it's, it's one thing to be, you know, having a label, for instance, like, because sometimes people can start to identify with a label, like, oh, I'm depressed, that's my identity. And it's, it's not as much of an identity, but a diagnostic criteria for other practitioners to know that this is the cascade of symptoms that we need to be on the lookout for. So I think that can kind of blur. So to have a solution was very, very good to have. And so he did do supplements. It's zinc because copper and zinc need to be a one-to-one -one ratio. So it's said that if you give more zinc than copper, then it flushes the copper out and you have a more normalized uh, balance. And so that testing was done. Um, then with the DAT testing, there's the 10 different hit categories that you're probably familiar with that Dr. Nudley came up with the depression and anxiety test. So you can have genetic, lifestyle, um, I think it's exercise. There's, a, there's 10 different categories that, oh, I think in um, basically the home life. So there's some different things that cannot be changed. But the good news is eight out of 10 can be. So when I went through the program, I had nine out of ten hits, <laughs> which, so which showed, that was high. which explained the fact the depression. Right, you're right. depressed because boom, 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 right. boom, boom. Exactly, and so we started to kind of those started to change. I was being taught uh, as you go through the program. There's a lot of lectures, so they do the hydrotherapy. Um, I don't know if you touched on that, but it's the mentioned hot and it a cold. little bit in the last program, yeah. Yeah, hot and cold, hot and cold. Some people love it, some people hate some it. Some people, yeah, I, I was kind of a mixed mixed bag. When I first started, I thought, how is this going to help? I just, I had a bad attitude about a lot of things coming from healthcare and thinking that these just sound like quackery methods, and that's kind of what I was thinking in my head. And then I started to see Dr. Nudley's lectures, and I saw the evidence scientific research that he was putting, that really resonated because that's indisputable. A lot of people want hard, cold, scientific facts, mm -hmm. and he delivered on that, so I couldn't dispute that. Mm -hmm. And plus, I was seeing people around me getting better, and I wasn't fully engaged. I tried to leave um, four or five times, and uh, at one point, basically, I was- You tried in, to leave tried four to or leave five times? Tried to leave the program. Uh, How did you do that? Uh, <laughs> I called a taxi and tried to <laughs> leave outside the gate, and. Nathan Hyde, I guess, intervened with the taxi. And How did he do that? He went to the front gate and was waiting for the taxi to come. And How did he know the taxi was coming? Um, it was, I think it was somehow intercepted on the phone where they had figured this now, out. Now they take your phones away when you go through. And I had had my phone when I wasn't supposed to at one point. Like I kept it an extra day. So I was not 
not compliant. I was one of the more difficult participants. You were a rebel. Um, I was definitely, yeah, but not for a cause. I don't remember what yeah. I was rebellious You weren't for. like Jimmy Dean. <laughs> yeah. Or just, you were like Jimmy Dean, a rebel without a cause. Without a you cause. No I'm like, I just, I don't know where I was going to go. But, um, so that was a challenge. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting so ride. So Nathan found out that you had uh, called a taxi to pick you up and take you out of there. Yes. And if, where was the taxi going to take you? I had had a hotel in Col Colfax, uh, where I was going to go. And Dr. Nedley, at one point, he um, he caught wind of all this. And he's like, we know what you do at hotels, Christy. We're not going to let you go there. And so... Um, oh, because you had tried to kill yourself in a hotel. Yeah. So he he had, he's like, we're not going to let you Now, how go. many days into the program did you call the taxi? Because um, it's a 10-day program, so... Was it the second day, third day? That point, there were some other times that I had packed. So I would pack my suitcase and basically try to go. Um, but at one point, Dr. Christina Harris, I don't know if you met know her. her. Uh, she tells her testimony at the program. But she, her and I became like sisters. Mm -hmm. um, I had said some things that stuck out to her and the staff that she had also dealt with. Um, I said, I don't fit in. I said, where are people with, well, she didn't say this, but I was like, where are all the people with tattoos? I'm like, I can't relate. <laughs> like, you know, I just want to relate to to people like that. And so she was sent to my room and cried on my bed because she did not want me to leave. And at first I thought, this is crazy. She doesn't even know me. Why does she care? Really? And she showed me empathy that day that someone loved me enough to say, no, we're not going to let you do this. And do you remember, was this the second day or third day or fourth day or fifth day? Um, that specific instance, I think, was the second day. Second day, so early yeah, on. Now, just to clarify for those that are, yeah. that are watching this, the, 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 the Weimar Nedley program, it's, it's 10 days, and there's about 20 people there, and then they're surrounded also by uh, a very qualified yes. group of loving uh very intelligent, empathetic yes. staff Amen. who are watching over you at all times, yes. including Nathan Hyde mm -hmm. and including um, Dr. Harris. Yeah, Dr. Harris and uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, that's right, and, and others. Yeah. And so they're always watching you. And so yes. somehow they intercepted your uh, phone call yes. or found out about your phone call yeah. to uh, call a taxi and to go to a hotel. That's right. And so Dr. Harris then came into your room and pleaded with you not to do it. Yeah, the, this was a little further down the line um, with actually, I there was nothing that was gonna work in my mind. And so she called my counselor at the time, uh, said, Flavia's not gonna work, uh, I'm not gonna work, Dr. Nedley, you're gonna have to get here and help us out. And so he came out of his office and I had my bag packed, I was on the third floor, lugging my suitcase down, he stops me on the middle landing there and says, where are you going? <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm going out. I'm going home. And he's like, really? And so he's like, where are you planning to go? And he asked me a really poignant question that I had no answer to. He said, what have we done here to harm you? And I had to stop and pause. And I said, nothing. And he said, where are you going to go? And I said, take me to the psychiatric institute in Sacramento. I'll fit in there. And he's, he had nothing to do as a critical care physician. He had to call the next of kin, which is my mom and dad, and let them know of a change in condition like you would in a hospital setting. And he half expected them to say, you know, let her go. We'll take her to the psych institute again. And they said, no, Dr. Nelly, do everything you can to keep her there. So my parents were instrumental in this whole entire thing, having the faith that I could get help. And so they said to keep me there. So it's by God's grace and my parents and Dr. Nudley working together to keep me in this program. Wow. So. And, and again, just to clarify that the program is a multifaceted program. Yes. Where um, Dr. Nedley and others like Dr. Harris, Christina Harris, yeah. are giving uh, lectures, teaching about depression and anxiety and the causes and the, the things to do to get out of this and suicidal issues. So you have lectures. You also mm -hmm. have, uh, you're given a, a plant-based uh, very healthy diet yes. for your meals. Your mm -hmm. phone is taken away, yes. except for 45 minutes in the evening. At least that's what it's supposed Same. to be. But yeah. you had <laughs> you had kind of circumvented that and yeah. kept your phone. Yeah. And then you also have hydrotherapy, which is hot and cold water treatments. You get mm -hmm. massage. Right. You have a, a 
very vigorous uh, exercise program. Yes. Uh, lights out at nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, uh, Daniel knocking on my door five thirty mm -hmm. every morning. Yes. Time to get up and exercise. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and so it's a very intense program that that deals with a whole host of things, basically to try to reboot your 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 body and your mind and your right. life, along with the blood work and Dr. Nedley looking at all the details that he sees in the charts right. and recommending supplements. So it's this whole combination of, it's kind of like a health boot camp. Yes. Exactly. And all the, and the staff are all, you know, committed to helping you get through this. That's right. That's, That's right. what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Nedley stood there and, <laughs> and stopped you. He, he stopped me. Yeah. I mean, we kind of laugh about it today, but you know, at the time it was, I think I pulled something out of, you know, I thought this was a voluntary program. Uh, let me talk to my lawyers and we, Dr. Nedley and I, if he were sitting here, we'd be laughing about it and I've apologized because <laughs> I was just ridiculous. And um, so he, you know, obviously had to do his due diligence and call my family and all that. So he was very gracious, uh, allowed me to stay. And um, Dr. Harris was like, I asked her, I'm like, well, what am I going to do in three days? Because I had the three-day program at that point, and she she remembered the oh, resurrection. So it wasn't a ten-day program. It for was you? it was ten day, but I wasn't engaged. Like that was basically the pivotal point. Is the last three days. So that all happened with Dr. Nedley on the stairs and wanting to leave on the seventh day. And um, basically, Dr. Nedley told his staff, though, that legally we cannot keep her here. She's in danger and, you know, we don't have the staff to keep her on site. So we need to send her to Sacramento Psych unless you sleep outside her door and take shifts and cycle in and out and watch her all night. And they did that. They did that. Linda, the program director, it was Linda. Pilar, um, one of the, uh, she helps with the program and then Christina Harris, and it might have been Priscilla, the nurse at the time, actually. It might not have been Linda, but the three of them basically cycled. And they slept outside night. your door? Slept outside of my door. Oh, wow. I had no I had no idea this was wow. happening. Yeah, I slept all night. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I wonder how, I'm, there, I'm sure there's so many people that struggle with these issues that if they had, if they were in an environment surrounded by people that were trying to help them. Yes. You know, how many people would get out of this? Yes, exactly. And, and what we'll talk about at the, in the last part three, we'll go into the resources that are available to people because they don't, if they go through the 10 day program, that's fantastic, but some people can't afford that. Right. And so there's other options. Yes. There's a home program, there's a community mm -hmm. program, there's different programs, different yeah. ways. So we'll get into all that. Uh, but I want to, well, let's go back to, to, um, you know, at what point did you feel like exercising and eating a good diet uh, was beginning to actually help you? So you, you, you know, when did you kind of get on board? <laughs> what was, I mean, Dr. Nedley stopped you, but when did you, when did you decide, I, I really, I, I'm going to give this a try? It was the last three days. Um, I was very engaged, but Dr. Nedley said, well, you've had the three-day program, you need to stay. And, you know, what do you mean the three day program? Um, you've been engaged. there for seven days, right? And then mm -hmm. three days were the engaged days, right? Right. So, so he considered really like you went through a three day program yeah, because the first seven days you just weren't into it? Exactly. Because so I was trying to run and I was coming off of medications. And so I just wasn't able to rationally be present for a lot of the, the lectures just because my mind was, so just went, was hurting. Whoosh. Yeah. And so he's like, you need to stay. And so I told him I would think about it. Really, I had a date with this millionaire when I got home. And so I was thinking about this and I was going to go home. So I told him I'd think about it. Uh, but there is a point in the program where we have a burning. And basically, you put all the different things you may remember. I you remember put, that. You can put misbeliefs. You can put medications. Yeah. It's it's whatever you want to put in there that you just want to get out of All the bad things you want to get rid of. You write right. them on a piece of paper and then you right. burn them. And then you put it in the fire and you make you say a public testimony and studies have shown that if you do that, you're more likely to stick with it. And so I stood up, I said I was going to put meat into the fire, I was going to put my cigarettes into the fire, and I was going to put my relationship with men into the fire. And so I put all those things, the staff was pretty happy about those, they weren't expecting a lot from me, they weren't sure what I was even going to put in, so they were happy about that. Um, but then I go home, I have this date, and I'm at home, I'm jogging in my, patient, in my parents' neighborhood, and so I, now, now you're, you're done now. You're, you're describing done. at the end of the program, you went yeah. home. Yeah, and then I went home. So I didn't end up staying. He's like, well, you know where we're at. That's what Dr. Nudley said. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. okay. 
So he was anticipating I would need to come back. Um, so I went home. I was following the program as much as I could. My parents saw a pretty big turnaround even in that short amount of now, time. Did he take you off all the, the benzos and all the meds that you were on during those 10 days? Everything except trazodone. That was the last thing that he took me off of, but all the other things I was off of. And did you go through side effects? Oh, uh, yes. It was it was rough. Um, a lot of um, feeling kind of disconnected from my body. It's kind of hard to articulate, but just weird side effects. I don't know if you can attest to what you had went through, but just not feeling myself, just not uh, yeah, thinking totally. right. Just I mean, when I went blah. through, when I was there and I went yeah. through the, I mentioned in, the, in part one that I went four days without sleeping. Yeah. I think it was in part, maybe I mentioned in part two. Four, four days without sleeping uh, and it, and I was getting off the benzo, uh, the lorazepam was, was my benzo that Dr. Nedley took me off. And he, he warned me, he said, you're going to have two weeks where it's going to be a nightmare for you, but you'll get through it. Or maybe he said 10 days, uh -huh. 10 days or two weeks, but you'll get through it. And during those, uh, during the time when I was withdrawing from that benzo, I mean, I had all kinds of suicidal thoughts. Uh, uh, and I just, I remember kneeling and praying and, and just saying, God, I'm right on the edge. I'm on the edge of just going into a psych ward. I've never had this happen to me before, but my mind is just, and I had all kinds of, uh, the, the, the devil, I think, was putting all these thoughts mm -hmm. in my head. And yeah. I'd get up in the morning after I hadn't slept all night, and I'd hear this voice that says, ah, ha, 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 well, you know, I'll see you tonight, Wahlberg. Oof. See, and I got you. I got you, Wahlberg. You're That's... mine. You're mine. All these thoughts. And... And then I had this picture of my kids on my, uh, in my room, on my desk, my dresser, of Seth and Abby looking at me. And I mm. remember thinking to myself, I can't kill myself. What am I going to do to my kids? Mm -mm. What am I going to do to my wife? You know, they're going to be devastated if I take my life. So I kept saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. And I do want to talk about more at some point how it was, it was, it was promises. There were promises in the Bible that I would just cling to for my life, you know, like mm -hmm. the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Mm -hmm. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And I would hold on to these promises, say, God, you gotta do this, you gotta help me, you gotta hold on to me, you gotta restore my soul, you gotta bring my mind back to mm -hmm. me, because I'm just, you know, I'm going through the worst thing I've ever been through. And mm -hmm. I kept saying, I'm not gonna kill myself because I, I don't wanna hurt my family. And Lord, you just got to bring me through this. And praise the Lord, he did. <laughs> so you went through the program and you, then you went home. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where things improved, right? It, it improved um, to a point. Because <laughs> um, I was trying to keep up with the program. So I was like jogging towards uh, one of the physician's houses that Don McIntosh, she's the spiritual advisor. Yes, yeah, so you had spiritual counseling there yes. too. You had a... a, a truth therapy from a yes. counselor and then you had a spiritual counselor right. pointing you to God's love and his word and that he loves you no matter what you're going through right. even though you're in the midst of all this right. and my thoughts were telling me you know that the Lord doesn't love me anymore I've gone too far I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on the devil's side um, all kinds of thoughts and like I said these Bible promises I just kept clinging to these and I kept telling myself I can't rely on my mind mm -hmm. I can't rely on my thoughts yeah. I've got to rely on these thoughts these are true right when Jesus says come to me I will give you rest take my yoke upon you learn of me and God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son and Jeremiah 31 I think it's verse 3 is it Jeremiah 31 31 3 I've loved you with an everlasting love uh, Romans 15, 13, about the God of hope mm. will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. There's all these different promises. Micah 7, 8, that says, when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Amen. And beautiful. these promises, the, this is what I clung to with the little bit of faith that I had, that God still loved me, he still cared for me, and he was going to bring me through. Amen. And did you go through anything like that? Uh, I started to um, get interested in the Lord when Priscilla, the nurse of the program, gave me Bible studies. And During the 10 days? It was the second half of when I came back. Oh, so, the, so, you, so you didn't just go through it once. I, I had <laughs> some extra credit. <laughs> some, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I had some extra credit. Yeah, um, but I yeah. did go through what you're saying, though, that, that spiritual darkness. And looking back on it now... Uh, I see it as a great controversy experience, and a lot of participants do come in 
with that same battle and it's a spiritual battle and um, I'm not saying that's the answer I mean there's a lot of brain chemistry and things but but Jesus is the solution to any of our problems here on this earth and to not accept that is doing oneself a grave disservice uh, because he's the one he's the only one that rescues us and he promises to save us and so that was pivotal in my recovery was accepting the Lord and was so. that so there was the first 10 days, then you went home. When did you re-accept the Lord or when did you discover that this was really a spiritual battle? Because you said that uh, in the last time that when you, in the last program went, that when you got to Weimar, you were not interested in God. No. You had left the Lord, you had left the church, you weren't praying anymore, right. you were, had all these bad mm -hmm. habits and yeah. you weren't really interested in God. That's right. So at what point did you start to think, well, I'm gonna give you another chance? <laughs> well, I see his hand over the whole entire thing, um, but like kind of back to what led me back for the extra credit, and then that and kind of factored in. How long ago was in. it? How far um, when you when you left and you went back to Texas? How many was it? Days, weeks, months until you went back to Weimar? It was about a week. About I think a week. It was about seven days, and okay. so I was trying to do all this stuff on my own. Though thinking, ah, oh, you know, I've got all this program algorithm. I've got this figured out. You know, I could do this at home not realizing that I still had more work to do. And Dr. Nedley is a physician and I'm not. And I was trying to go on my own understanding and do what Christy wanted and not what the professionals <laughs> recommend. I don't recommend that. Um, but basically I was jogging towards the doctor's house that um, Pastor Don had tried to set me up with because nutritionally they do a lot of the lifestyle, um, you know, plant-based diet and things like that. And, and this so, doctor was in Texas, and, right? Yeah, and he lived so in my So set you up doesn't mean he was trying to connect you oh, with no, as a boyfriend. Yes. No, no, no. He was trying to basically um, connect have you with a resource. Influence. Yeah. For to, you in so from Northern California, right. Pastor Don connected you with a doctor in right. Texas that you could Right. So that get I'd have a resource. Help. Yeah, more research. And so I was running and I see his house and I, I turn around the other direction because I'm like, I don't want to go there. That reminds me of Weimar. And so I go back to, there's a water tower that says Bethesda. And as I'm turning the corner, it says SDA. I'm like, okay, God, I can't outrun you because wherever you go, there you are. And this was in Texas. And this was in Texas. And so just everything God was just saying, just go back, just go back to Weimar. That's where you had health and healing. So when you said SDA, that means Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist. And, so you, and you actually grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist and I grew church up in and Seventh Dr. Nedley is the Seventh-day right. Adventist physician. Precisely. So you yeah. saw that on dr running to the other doctor's house. Yes. Or yeah. in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. You saw these little signs yeah. and you thought, this is God talking to me. Yes. I need to go back. Okay. <laughs> I need to All right. go back. And so by God's grace and Dr. Nedley being gracious, they had me come back. And so I got to stay another two weeks Oh, wow. um, in that two weeks, the nurse gave me Bible studies, and this is kind of how that Dr. factored Harris. in. Um, this was Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla. Priscilla, she's she's actually in uh, Loma Linda getting her doctorate right now, but she was the nurse of the program that I went through, and her I, her and I to this day are like sisters as well, because I do believe a brother is born out of adversity, yes. as it says in Proverbs, and yes. I claim that, because some of my best friends are as a result of some of these tumultuous times, so it's, God even blessed that. So you had so, Bible studies the second time, part two. Yes, part two. And what were the what were the topics, and what were what really affected you the most? The sanctuary message is what really brought me back. Um, she had some pretty in-depth Bible studies, and even just seeing the simple outline of how God wanted to come as close as He could to us, although He couldn't coexist with sin, but He wanted to be that close to us because He loves us that much that He did everything He could to be that close and invite us into his house and that being whole being the model, sanctuary the sanctuary right. being the, the temple service in the right. in the old testament and you you saw the model and you saw god wants me inside that temple yes. spiritually yes. so i can recover right right and that just the whole model just made sense practical sense and really? it's and so that brought me back and then i was asked to be baptized and so i got baptized on moses rock there at weimar wow. dedicated my heart my life over to God and I've never looked back and I praise God for that experience and I mean there's ups and downs life is not perfect you know I still struggle but compared to where I was compared to today it's it's a dramatic change and I give all glory to God for the way that he had his hand over that whole entire thing mm -hmm. so it's it's 
His grace. <laughs> so I'm curious, what, what was the point where you realized from when you first got there, you said you didn't want God or any of this, to the point that you realized that there, this is a spiritual battle that I'm going through. This is not just a, a chemical thing. You know, the cloud I've been under, my depression, whatever else, the suicidal thoughts, that this is all a battle, like you said, between, it was a great controversy between mm -hmm. God and Satan, mm -hmm, and you right. were in this war. Mm -hmm. You're not just uh, dealing with, you know, flesh and blood, but you're in a war. Right. So when did you, was, did you realize that when you, when you saw SDA, that you thought, you know, God's talking to me, or, or when did you realize that? You know, I don't know if I was ever consciously aware during that process, but then hearing the backstory um, from the staff, and it's hard to see outside of oneself. And so it was difficult to, to know how to articulate that. But what they said, that what they saw, how difficult things were and how, you know, these things that would help you know, if one is not willing to do these things, I mean, there's something that's disconnected there. So they prayed, they pray over participants. I mean, and just knowing that now working in the program, we'll get together as a staff and have prayer over individuals specifically, and then seeing God's hand and how he brings people out of that darkness and breaks the chains. Because Satan promises you do, do whatever you want, you know, do your own will, and then he snares you because it, it has a hook on it. Anything addictive, it has a hook. It's gonna snare you and it's not gonna lead you to life or to a solution. And God says, follow these commandments, follow me. And he wants us to be happy. And there's so many other things we can do. It's just 10. <laughs> and so he wants us to follow him out of love. And these are boundaries and guidelines of our life that bring us health and happiness. And to not do them is Satan's trick that you know something better is gonna be beyond them, but they're not. So it just was a real understanding and, you know, it's a daily walk and recommitting to God every day and seeing where he leads. So it's, it's a struggle, I think, as you said, I think you had referenced um, how this are, these are not new to a certain man, that we all struggle with something. That's right. And so we need to, to help one another. That's right. So you say it's just 10, you're referring to the 10 commandments. 10 commandments, yeah. <clears throat> right, that, yeah, and the, and the basic idea is that uh, God has given us Ten Commandments, and following those Ten Commandments are what's best for us. Right. We 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 function better when we don't lie. When we right. When we um, you know we're faithful morally, sexually to our spouses, or if we're not married, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, putting God first, not having any idols, no mm -hmm. idols, honoring our parents, just mm -hmm. those basic principles, and ultimately God's laws of love. love. Amen. Love him and love your neighbor as yourself, and that's kind of like the safety zone. And when we stay in the safety zone, uh, we're we're much less likely, uh, you know, to encounter the devil. Although the devil hits us anyway, right? But we have then strength to say no, right? But but when, when we step outside of God's will, then we're asking for trouble, mm -hmm. and we we then get exposed to a lot more of the of the enemy's attacks right. and uh, he, he messes us up mm -hmm. and then the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come to take all those sins Yay. where we've stepped out <laughs> yes. and he's he's paid the price he's suffered for us because he loves us That's anyway right. Right. and then he wants to forgive our sins come into our hearts change our lives and then bring us back into mm -hmm. the safety zone <laughs> right 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 that's the way it is yeah yeah so a uh, uh, for me, when I got to Weimar, I mean, I didn't have to, I didn't get there thinking to myself, I don't want God, I don't want to be here. I, I was craving help. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I believed in him and I still believe in him. Mm -hmm. But it was the worst crisis of my life. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I didn't understand why I had insomnia and I couldn't sleep. And then I went on the medications to try to help me sleep and they made things worse. And then I went on the lorazepam, and then I told Dr. Nedley about that on the phone, and then he said, you need to come to Weimar, and we need to help you with this. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, I knew I was in a great controversy. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew the battle was on between God and the devil, between right and wrong. Uh, and I felt it just intensely, intense, intense. Like I mentioned, I, I would hear these voices inside my head, you know, saying, ha, 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 Wahlberg, you're mine now, I've got you, you're mm -hmm. never getting out of this. And I kept saying, no, 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 I don't believe that. I can't believe that. And I just would rely on, on the Bible, on God's promises. And um, 
you know, one of the one of the things that somebody wrote recently that uh, I want to address is the issue of, you know, why doesn't or why if God is good and loving, why does he allow his people to go through these things? And why doesn't he just take them away mm -hmm. sometimes right away? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? And also, are, are there specific verses that really meant a lot to you as you, you know, went through this journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do have some. I have a couple that I still cling to to this day. Um, but some of the thoughts, I guess referring to spirit of prophecy, there is something that resonated with me, and I believe it's in Ministry of Healing, that talks about how God doesn't just put worthless ore into the fire. He tries his precious jewels under the fire of affliction. Mm -hmm. And so you, my thought is I don't believe God is the cause of anything negative. Uh, I believe that is a, a opposing force at work, and that would be what I call Satan. And so I, there's this controversy. It's a very real battle. We battle not of it against flesh and blood, but against principalities and things in high places. And by putting Ephesians 6 armor on, we have this protection. But there's also things that, um, even like in the story of Job, he allowed Job to go through these things. Mm -hmm. And he called upon Job knowing that he would still choose him in the end. And so like Daniel went into the fire, even if God did not save him, he still would purpose his heart to the Lord. So there's a real, um, a real battle, but I guess in saying that it would be more, I'm thinking of like the, he's trying his precious jewels into the fire. It's building our characters. Um, that's my thoughts. What, what are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I finally learned, it took me a while, but like there, there's one verse, uh, there actually there's a lot of verses, but let me share a verse in First Peter. This verse really helped me because I went through this for months and I kept, you know, thinking, Lord, why are you allowing me to go through this? Mm -hmm. If I'm surrendered to you, I'm trusting you. Uh, why is this still here? Mm -hmm. Why am I still depressed? Right. Why am I still, I don't have an, an appetite. I'm losing weight. Mm -hmm. I'm not sleeping like I need to be sleeping. I'm still having thoughts that the enemy is harassing me to take my life. Uh, you know, I don't understand mm -hmm. why this is happening. And there, there, there's been a number of verses that really helped me, but one of them was First Peter chapter 5, verse 10. It says, but the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, mm, that's profound. he will make you uh, perfect, he will establish you, he will strengthen you, and he will settle you. Amen. And I read that and I thought, it says, after you have suffered for a while. So I thought, well, I don't know how long a while is, but I need to trust him in the midst of this because this is not going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. this, it's just, it's a while. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I've concluded that God allows us to go through these sufferings, as you said, to develop our characters, mm -hmm. to teach us to trust him yes. even in a crisis. Yes even when things go south, even yes. when things are really bad. That's right. And I believe that when the final crisis comes, um, that those who have learned this lesson mm -hmm. will be able to trust God no matter what. Amen. No matter what happens, we need to be able to trust him. And that he, he ultimately, that he's good, mm -hmm. that he cares for us. Amen. He wants what's best for us. Right. He's going to bring us through this mm -hmm. and we're going to learn lessons all along the way. And when it's all over, um, we'll be glad that we went through this. I mean, right. I, I've been through, I mean, to me, it was, you know, as you went through, I, my struggles were just, to me, they were uh, cataclysmic. Mm -hmm. And, but now that the Lord has brought me through them and my mind has snapped back and my, you know, I can get up and go jogging yeah, with you this morning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've got a wonderful relationship with my wife and, and my children and I, you know, nice. things are going good right now. Awesome. And I look back 
and I just say, you know, it was it was worth it. I wouldn't trade it yeah. because the lessons I've learned so that the next time whatever comes my way, some terrible thing or whatever, I'll be able, hopefully by the grace of God, just to trust him and say, Lord, we've been through this before and I don't know how long it's going to take for this to change, but I'm going to trust you anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I just I, th I think the bedrock issue of whether God is good is is just fundamental mm -hmm. that he is a good God yes and that he wants what's best for us that's right and so that's that's you have that same conviction I, I feel the same um, I this may sound counterintuitive and may not make a lot of sense but I'm grateful for my depression uh, I would not have been in that program it changed my life um, I've had promotions at work by being transparent uh, I've had uh, actually better life satisfaction. Uh, I'm happy. I find joy in little things. Um, you know, today we went for that run. I was super happy. My serotonin probably went up to here just watching the sunrise. I'm thinking, wow, God, look at your blessing and abundant. It's a snowfall and there was some deer that ran across the path. And there's just so many good things to think about. And I'm like, oh, it just there's so many beautiful things to be grateful for and to give thanks for. So I'm just so grateful for that experience, not for the, the suffering, but I do believe it led me to better things. And so Romans 8.28 is the promise that I think of that all things work to the glory of those who love the Lord. Jeremiah 29.11, I have plans to prosper you, plans for a hope and a future. And that's true for each one of us. My case is not a special case. Mm -hmm. uh, God wants that for each one of us. And so that's so hopeful. And I just, I'm so thankful for that, so. Yeah, Jeremiah 29, 11 was a big text for me too, because it says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, yes. says the Lord. Yes. Thoughts of peace. peace. And when I'm having all these thoughts, and the devil, he tries to, I'm convinced that a lot of it is, is Satan and his angels. Yes. And I know that there's a blending between, you know, our thinking and his temptations, and it's hard to kind of, you know, it's uh -huh. kind of murky as to where one ends and mm -hmm. where the other begins, but right. I know that the enemy is involved in all this. And uh, Dr. Nedley once said, when you when you add depression to antidepressants, mm. he said that's the devil's playground. Oh, did and you? I used to, yeah, I remember that. And so, you know, when you when you're going through all this, um, we have to realize that there's a spiritual battle, and that God is the one that can get us through this. Yeah. That we need we need God. We're fighting an enemy, mm -hmm. and we need strength. And, and a lot of times this battle is manifested in our thoughts where yeah. we're thinking negative thoughts. And so like and at Weimar, they teach you to counter the negative thoughts with truth. That's right. And you, the truth is what the word says. I know. So like the verse that you said where God says, I know the thoughts I think toward you. Mm -hmm. These are thoughts of peace, right. not of evil, to give you hope in the future. And a lot of times I'd be thinking the negative thoughts and then I think, no, these are... These are not God's thoughts. These are just my thoughts. And so I'd rely on the verse. It says, God says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, thoughts of peace. Is that in your booklet that you have? I, I don't remember if that text is there or not, but there's a lot of, a lot of Bible verses, a lot of stories, a lot of struggle. Mm -hmm. And then there's the victory Amen. <laughs> that God gives us. So any other promises that are precious to you? Jeremiah, you said 29, 11 is a, really important to you. I claim them daily. There's a resource online, I believe it's revivalformission.org, that Melody Mason uh, is our prayer minister at the GC, but she has a resource that can be printed out for free online, and, and people can cut these out. I've done this, and then you refer to them in the morning, and it sets the morning, it sets the tone, and they're promises. They're like blank checks for his kids, and so we can claim these and trust that he's going to honor them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, there's not another specific one though per se, but that's a resource that I, yeah, I use. promises. Yeah. I yeah. have, I think I showed you this and I have my, mm -hmm. my little, uh, one of the things when I went through Weimar, I, they recommended that I get these little three by five cards oh, yeah. uh -huh. and I write, um, different thoughts that are good thoughts and different sayings and different promises. So like I've got this one, Luke 10, 18 where Jesus said, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and Amen. nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. So I've got that one there and I have other, other little things like one of them says, uh, don't expect instant healing, <laughs> trust grace, uh, grow in grace, take one day at a time. 
And so these little, I have all kinds of little... Those are valuable. ...little things. Yeah. I do trust Jesus even though my faith isn't perfect. Mm. Here's a quote from Ministry of Healing. In every trial, Christ will give us help. Nice. And I just went through these one by one. Here's another one that says, I don't like it when I lose sleep, but Jesus still loves me. His grace is sufficient. This too shall pass. And he uses trials to teach us to trust him. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got all my little, did they give you little cards like this when they you went through? They didn't do that when I came through the program. I kind of wish they did, but they're doing that now. That's standard. That's, that's very helpful. Yeah, so the bottom line is we're kind of getting down toward the end here for this part two is that one of the greatest resources that we've learned that ha that brought us both through mm -hmm. is the promises of That's God. Right. It's his word. We're in a That's battle. Right. We're in a great controversy between good and, and evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, God loves us and he wants to help us. That's right. He wants to lead us, lead us through. So I'll just read, I'll just share this text again from uh, 1 Peter 5, 5, 10. It says, the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, will himself uh, make you perfect and establish you and strengthen you and settle you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another verse, you, I'm sure you, you are familiar with this one in John 10:10, 10, 10, mm, yes. where Jesus is talking and he said that the thief does not come but to steal and to kill and to destroy, the thief being the devil. But then he says, I have come that you might have life Amen. and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. And that tells us that the character of Satan is to destroy us. And the character of Jesus is to give us life more abundantly, to help us, to heal us, and to save us. So we recommend Jesus Christ. He loves you, and whatever you're going through, he'll bring you through. Amen. Thank you. This three-part series, Finding Hope in Depression and Despair, is now available on DVD from Whitehorse Media. To order, simply call 1-800-782-4253 or order online at whitehorsemedia.com. To learn even more about how you can overcome anxiety, fear, discouragement, and depression, Whitehorse Media recommends these two easy-to-read pocketbooks, Help for the Hopeless and Secrets of Inner Peace. In Help for the Hopeless, Steve Wolberg reveals personal details about an awful trial he passed through during the summer of 2017 how God brought him through the horror of deep darkness, and how you can find help too, whatever your struggles. In Secrets of Inner Peace, Steve explains how deep, lasting peace is only possible through discovering the love and goodness of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and through the power of His Word. Both of these small pocketbooks are easy to read, heartwarming, encouraging, and great for sharing with your loved ones, friends, and even with strangers. This three-part DVD series, Finding Hope in Depression and Despair, and both of these enlightening pocketbooks are now available from White Horse Media by calling 1-800-782-4253. That's 1-800-782-4253. A fully illustrated ebook version of Secrets of Inner Peace can also be purchased immediately on the website, secretsofinnerpeace.net. That's secretsofinnerpeace.net.